Yes. I hesitated on the yes because I wasn't sure if we were recording. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another brand new Rubbing Muscle podcast. This is episode 95. And yet again, we've got another former rugby player with a Masters, but this time... Matt Dickens' his Masters is not in nutrition, it's in strength and conditioning, although we spend most of the time going over nutrition. Uh, Matt works for MotoGP, doing strength and conditioning around the world, would you believe, uh, taking care of those guys. He goes into a bit more detail, but he is highly sought after in the strength and conditioning world, but he's also starting to come out of up come out with a lot more stuff about a plant-based lifestyle that he lives. And generally, um, if you remember in the episode a while back where I discussed about how a lot of my training and nutrition and coaching in general is trying to get people to live a much lower stress life. And I guess this is what this conversation slash discussion ends up being with Matt. Uh, We talk all about how he became um, a vegan, although he doesn't like that term different problems that live in such a plant-based lifestyle present, but also not just the problems, but solutions for those problems, which is really important because, you know, when we decide or when someone decides to make a change in their diet, often we come up with all the excuses to why we can't do it. So here, every time we have something that sort of gets in the way and makes his sort of lifestyle that he chooses to live difficult we have actually a decent little solution so really good stuff if you want to follow matt it's at matt dickens at c right now but if you're listening to this anytime in the future it's either going to be at matt dickens sc or it'll be atlas health and performance so check it out over there check him out on instagram that's where he puts out most of his stuff but for now let's listen to this episode with matt dickens strength and conditioning coach All right, guys, so we are live here with Matt Dickens, uh, performance coach, strength and conditioning coach. I was, about, I was about to say, I just asked you what you'd prefer to be known as, but I went, almost went straight in with the opposite of what you asked. Whatever. How are you doing, Matt? I'm very well, thank you, Tom. How are you? I'm good. Um, as I've warned you twice now, because we're recording this for a second time, uh, I've given you a huge speech beforehand. Everyone's expecting a lot from you. But if you were just to describe yourself with one sentence, what would you say? Yeah, I'm just somebody who likes to make the most of life, enjoy life, and help other people um, get the best out of themselves and their lives too. Oh, I love it. I love it. That's great. Um, But as everyone is aware, uh, one of the reasons I was so intrigued to get you on this podcast is the fact that you're a uh, a vegan. How long have you been a vegan for? Um. Yeah, that's true. I, well, I feel like that word is so so controversial. Yeah, that's, we're going to get into that for sure. <laughs> I mostly tell people that I live a plant based um, lifestyle, so I've done that for just over eighteen months. Nice. Um, it very much came from a background of like eating a lot of meat and animal products, and telling my athletes that they need to eat more meat, and then um, a short while ago, uh, completely flip reversed. Yeah. Nice. Okay, well, we'll get into that in a sec. But first, um, I really do have to put you on the spot because it's time for our uh, fact of the week. Uh, fact of the week. Yeah. Well, we mentioned um, off recording beforehand that I did live in Andorra for three years. So a lot of people don't even know where Andorra is. Andorra is a small country in the Pyrenees between France and Spain. It's a part of Europe, but not not the EU. Um and yeah, it's one of the like top 10 smallest countries in the world. Nice. How long did you live there for? Three years. And um, how long would it take you to drive like the, from one side to the other? Of Andorra? Yeah. About an hour and a half. Oh, nice. So not too small. But still, no, very no, small. not too small. And the top ten may have been an exaggeration. Of, it's, it, it may be the thirteenth smallest country in the world. Huh. Uh, so not only an interesting fact, but an inaccurate fact, mate. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about that. You it's can all good. Criticizing me now, it was just only mate. If you give if you give the previous ninety episodes a listen and you hear the facts of the week, they are all <laughs> shit. So don't worry about <laughs> it. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Uh, it's like a tradition, so I, I, I'm enjoying them. I'm enjoying them. Um, cool. So, uh, yeah, so today's episode, I just wanted to 
sort of just sit down and, and, and chat, see um, sort of how you've managed to incorporate this plant-based lifestyle with your role and, and as a performance coach and all of that sort of stuff. So uh, I guess the first question is, how did you become a performance coach in the first place? Okay, so I guess my background is largely in strength and conditioning. So yeah. I'm happy to be called a strength and conditioning coach because I still do a large amount of strength and conditioning work and that's that's my history that's where I come from um about 10 years ago I tried playing rugby or I used to play rugby a lot um tried playing rugby in Argentina um got broke realized but played at a decent level in Argentina and realized that actually like the club um over there although professionalism didn't so much exist over there Uh um and it was only the national players that in the team that got um, got paid and the club or the, the highest level domestic league was still very much amateur. They still had full-time fitness support. Yeah. Uh, and being a part of that was the first time I really realized that like this job exists. Like, I love, I love training. I love the gym. I love rugby. Like, yeah, let's do that with my life. That would be awesome. Nice. Um, how so, old were you at the time? 22. Okay, cool. Yeah. 22. So, um, so yeah, so when I came back, um, I, long story short, contacted lo- all the Premiership clubs, like all the SNC departments within the UK, um, and and reached out on, in how I could work in rugby as a as a SNC coach, which was a completely new realm to me at the time. Um, did a got an internship at London Welsh. Did a, a PT qualification. Started a PT business. Did a masters and strength and conditioning science at St. Mary's Uni. Um, worked for three years for free at London Welsh and London Irish interning. Um, then got my first paid role in rugby. And then as much as I tunnel visioned, all I wanted to do was work in rugby. Um, pretty much as soon as I got that first paid role, um, left it and got a better position than what I thought in British diving. So I went to... so I completely changed sports, Um, had this great opportunity with the Olympic team based in Southampton, Um, worked for British Diving around uh, just following London 2012 for a couple of years. Um, Then, and through that worked with other sports, uh, freestyle ski and snowboarding, um, and still works in rugby at the time. Uh, used to run the program for Worthing Raiders, who we got promoted yep. to National One, so that's like level three in the UK. Um, I think they're back in National Two now. Yeah, we've um, got some mutual friends there. Oh, okay, cool. But nice. Um, carry on. Yeah, cool. Uh, so, so yeah, so I'm, circle. I'm, yeah, no, you good? Go, going on a little bit from <laughs> there. Um, I moved to Andorra, worked for the national ski team, ran the SNC program for their ski. Uh, for their snow sports and alpine skiing primarily, um, as well as snowboard cross, um, for three years. Then, whilst I was in Andorra, uh, through a mutual friend, um, got to know Bradley Smith, who's a MotoGP racer, um, started doing his strength and conditioning programming. He liked what I did, went to like a race, um, saw a few areas um, in the environment and that could be tweaked to improve his performance even further. Um, he liked that idea, brought me on full time. Nice. So I've been with him full time for just going into my third year now. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so a few things I want to touch on with that. So first, first question I kind of have is, um, I get a lot of, I got a lot of guys, um, every week pretty much, uh, emailing me or, or contacting me asking about how they can become a, a good strength and conditioning coach. And, I always suggest, you know, educate yourself as much as you can before you really concern yourself with earning too much money or or that sort of thing. (laughs) Because that's what all people want to do. They want to go straight in and make the big bucks. And I'm like, well, you don't know enough yet. Like, really spend some time on just putting all the work in towards being the best that you can. Then worry about, like, where you go and help out. And just, like, how many years of intern did you do? Uh, Just under three. Okay. And so... Or how long was it until from the moment you decided or the the time that you were sort of thinking, yeah, I'm going to be a, a S&C coach or I'm going to get into this, this is what I want to do, before you actually started getting properly paid and, and having a full-time job in it? Was it 
four years or yeah. so, or no, no, a I, masters. Just like, just under three years. So I did a a part time masters over two years at St Mary's Uni, which the workload's ridiculous and they don't let very many people do it over two years. Um, it has to be normally three or four. Um, I studied it as an intern and ran a PT business all at the same time to support myself through that. Um, and, and yeah, it was just short of three years till I got my first full, fully paid role in S&C. And that was a part-time paid role. Cause, well, that was, then I was started to put piece together three part-time paid roles in, in shape and conditioning. Nice. But I mean, that, that's how you got to do it and live in the dream really, mate. Live yeah. In the dream. yeah. I mean, I think it's such a, it's such a tricky industry because you have got to work your socks off and it, like, this is 10 years ago now Yeah. that I got into it and feel like shit, it was hard then. I don't, you know, and I went to St. Mary's uni, did my master's and that was one of four or five unis in the country that ran a master's. And now every uni in the country, in the UK runs a, undergraduate and a postgraduate course in strength and conditioning there's yeah. thousands and thousands of students coming out of uni every year and there's a handful of jobs just a handful of jobs and most of those go to coaches who've already been working in the, in the industry and already know people yeah like you could you, you almost you, actually you have i'm pretty sure for most especially if you're going championship premiership just to intern you pretty much have to have a master's and then like it's it and gets empire, really really empire difficult experience of coaching yeah so it's really hard just getting your foot in that door and then keeping it in there and yeah it's a tough industry but um so i'm assuming because of the tough industry you decided that you had to like just make sure that you were covering your best right by eating a shit ton of protein but since you've switched so talk to me in general, it was a terrible transition. But talk to me about your uh, your transit, your own transition, not that one, but into a plant based lifestyle. What what brought that about? Okay, so about just over two years ago, I started realizing that that animal agriculture has a huge impact on the environment, and I thought, well, I kind of care a bit about the planet and the environment. You know, like try to not use plastic bags and take my uh, reusable bag to the supermarket and not buy veg in plastic and whatever. So, and so the environmental impact just like started becoming aware of it and just cutting down how much meat I ate. I realized that beef was particularly environmentally unfriendly. And um, so I kind of cut down to a bit of chicken and fish a few times a week. And that just started a course of, uh, I, could, I can eat more like plant-based meals, more vegetarian meals, um, and did that for about six months um, without, you know, and just thinking, you know, I was being a bit more conscious about my choices and that was great. But over that time, and I kind of guess it accumulated towards the end of that six months that I just I, whether I saw a lot more videos about animal farming and the industry and especially like factory farming. And I, I, I just didn't really like what I was seeing. Decided yeah. that I didn't want to contribute to it anymore. And as much as I'll be the first to admit that I've killed animals in the past, personally, like I've shot rabbits, so I've been fishing, um, I've killed various animals, and I think I'm capable of doing that. Actually, if I was faced with an animal in front of me now, like if there was a pig in front of me or a cow, like I, I might be able to bring myself to kill it, but I wouldn't want to. Yeah. So it was a simple choice for me that I'd be hypocritical if I didn't want to kill that animal, I'd be hypocritical that if I paid someone else to do it. So I started to investigate living a more plant-based lifestyle. Um, started to learn more, started to incorporate a lot more plant-based meals within like a week or two, I decided, right, I'm just going to give this a go. So I went like, went all in fully plant-based, um, definitely made a lot of mistakes in regards to at first. I think I ate a lot more, a lot too much, quite a lot of fat because I was just relying on nuts seeds all the time mm -hmm. uh, unless you actually grind seeds up then you don't necessarily digest them very well because they just come out the other end yeah so like probably not getting not getting as much nutrients as i needed at first um but i, I learned a lot over the the first over that first year and actually surprisingly 
like I just had an incredible amount of energy. Nice. And I and I honestly felt like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders that I never knew existed. Um, and like now, and you just sat then, on your high horse, or what? Or what? You feel good, or is it, it literally physically a physical feeling of feeling? No, like, physically, so like less yeah. tension, like just tension around my shoulders and, and in my head. And I had way more energy. And nice. I, honestly, I didn't do it for health reasons. And I, I really seriously believe that I ate a healthy diet beforehand. Like I'm really interested in nutrition. I think it's a big part of like what we do. Yeah. And and it it's so complimentary and you have to be invested in that. I really believe that I ate a healthy lifestyle. I still believe that you can eat meat and, and eat a healthy lifestyle. Um but yeah, I just I just I just felt great from it. And I was like, oh, there's no good turning back. And aerobically, like I've my training switched a little bit. I I do a lot more aerobic and cardio work now, but I'm the fittest I've ever been in my life, so I'm really happy. That's awesome. That's awesome. And how old are you now to say that you're the fittest in your life? Just to thirty-two. So, yeah, nice. So you can compare that to when you're in your twenty. You know, you're playing. You essentially were playing professional rugby, you know, and in your in the prime of your your. Um, your athletic ability, athletic ability in like your early twenties, and and you're still, you're still feeling better now from that. But yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like my my whole philosophy of training has evolved during that time. I I, I look after my body better than I did then, um, and yeah. and and it's definitely focused in a different area. But I would never have gone out and run like 13, 14 miles for fun. Nice. So I, yeah, cycle yeah. 30 odd miles like just would never have done that when i was younger and now now it's a staple part of my week nice um and in fact so the reason i i thought it was even in better that i that i got you on the podcast because of this whole um the plant-based thing uh listeners of the podcast will know that um it, it previous week i i set myself or I, I laid out my goals for the year and one of them is to be a lot more eat a more humane diet essentially was was like the the restrictions i kind of put myself on i don't want to like definitely guarantee that i'll end up being a vegan or anything like that but i really do want to be a more environmentally conscious person with the with what i eat especially with what i eat but also with what i recommend to other people because um like as you say like the environment the planet is it's becoming a real issue and eventually we've got to stop looking the other way and realize that this is a thing that needs to sort of be done. And I don't want to spend the whole time because I know like, and you must know that the more time you spend on your high horse, the, the more you turn people down, you know, turn people off and, and then they don't want to hear it. And I understand because it's fucking scary, but there are lots of little things that we can do just to be, you know, just to, just to give ourselves a bit of a peace of mind. So um, I'm interested to see about how this whole transition, because it came over a long period of time, I think it's interesting and lots of sort of questions that I want to go on. So firstly, um, I guess you said about um, that you feel like you've got more energy and all this sort of stuff. Do you um, do you know how your or what your macros are or do you, do you log your food or track any sort of uh, uh, calories or anything like that? And did you do that before? No. Um... No, just as a personal philosophy of, of mine, like I've tried and it's just an unnecessary stress. Yeah. I'm very conscious and aware of what macros are in my food. Um, I, I feel like I won't know exactly, but I'm, I feel like I'm reasonable. I yeah. have a good relationship with food to know roughly what I'm eating throughout a day and in a meal. And yeah, so so in my head, like I always say, professional bodybuilder, I I don't really need, I don't want to spend the time no. logging all my food. And so especially if you've got your like really good habits in place anyway, like I always say, like you're still sort of logging your food, but you're just logging it in your head, right? Like you're just um, you're going through the day and you're and you're aware. Like if you ate a giant portion of uh, I don't know whatever it is, it could be like a real high carb, high fat meal earlier in the day. You're going to be aware of that for later in the evening or for the next few days or whatever. And you're, and you're going to do that. Whereas some people need to actually physically log it down. You don't, but would you say that your, the calories and, um, your protein especially is around similar to where it was before you cut meat out of your diet? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I might, I might eat a tiny little bit 
less protein now, uh-huh. but no more. But no more than like only only because I may have in the past eaten excessive amounts. Yeah, that makes sense. Like I definitely I I know I have sat down and done calculations and know that I generally eat about one point six to one point eight grams per kilo. Uh huh. So, um, so that for me, I, I'm happy. Like that's 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 more than enough. Okay, and then what sources do you use for your protein? So I'll always eat like a complete meal, meal with just a bit more carbs around training or after training. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the way I, I in my head figure that I'm always getting like a like a well balanced diet because I'm always eating a well balanced meal. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but then so protein sources, um, like if. A, if I was having like a smoothie bowl, then I'll use like chia seeds and hemp, hemp seeds a lot. Um, if I, and then, and then main meals, I'll eat a lot of like beans, legumes, um, black beans, especially. Um, I eat a lot, of, I eat a decent amount of tofu, um, but always buy like organic tofu. Um, uh, do you want to just quickly clarify why organic tofu is a lot better than non-organic? Yeah, so it's really interesting. Like, so I went for a bike ride this morning and listened to the Rich Roll podcast. I've always preferred organic just because there's so much, G- there's just controversy around GMO foods and there's a lot of GMO soy in the market. Yeah. Um, so I listened to the Rich Roll podcast with um, Zach Bush this morning mm-hmm. and he talked all about our microbiome and Monsanto and basically how genetically modified foods are that way so that they can still grow whilst this like roundup is on all the crops um and how that affects our microbiome and i'd listen to that podcast way more than than me but i just was basically <laughs> averse to the the idea of ex- extremely gmo um soy and feel that it's better quality and i always advocate higher quality food um anyway so or- organic to- uh, tofu seemed like a much better choice. Yeah. Um, I actually um, agree with that quite a lot. So we get a lot of people that are very anti, you know, chemicals and GMOs and all this sort of thing. And like a lot of the time I stress that like the alternatives are even worse. Like the fact, you know, we if we can get food for cheap, it's, it's really good. But the problem comes with soy is that it is so incredibly... Uh, like manufactured it's got so many additives so many different things like it it becomes like almost completely false food which you know it's enough it's okay if you have one soy like one of those meals a week or or something like that you know just as a treat or whatever it is but if it's a staple part of your diet you need to stay on top of that a lot more especially you know yeah if you're a plant-based and you're trying to get in your protein soy is going to be one of your main sources right absolutely yeah, so that's so you got to make sure that it's the best quality that you can get for sure. Um, yeah. Do you do you do any effort towards um, like getting a complete amino acid profile with each meal or or throughout the day? Yeah, so it's generally like the general guideline is combine like legumes with grains. Yeah, um, and that's and I I eat a lot of. Um, meals that combine the two so for example just like buddha bowls with um frijoles or like black beans and rice yeah. or yeah there's, there's generally a, a combination of protein sources um that that i'm getting a, a well-balanced um intake yeah and, and then that's just enough, right? Like you just make sure you've got a decent variety and you're, you're pretty certain that then from there you're going to cover all your bases. It's not like you actually have to track every single source or every single amount of amino acid that you've got going in, right? More or less, yeah. yeah. I take it... No, I, I, don't, I don't track every single amino acid that's going in. Right. I take... Um, I, I'll also... So a protein source, like just like I, I used to take like a whey protein powder... For plant, I take a, a plant-based protein powder now, like I put it in the smoothie bowl. Um, nice. I know that's got a, like a, it's a full spectrum of BCAs yeah. and acids in there. Um, I know that hemp, hemp seeds have got all the amino acids that you need. 
Um, and, and yeah, like I said, I follow that general guideline of, of grains and legumes. Beautiful. Um, and do you find that just shopping around being a, being a vegan is like, it's more pricey? Like what, how does your grocery bill compare to before? Uh, so there's, so that's a really good question because that's what a lot a lot of people ask, and a lot of people assume that they that vegan food choices are more a vegan diet is more expensive because they see the all these alternatives in the supermarket aisles and that they're really pricey, like cheese alternatives or milk alternatives. But I personally ag- ag- advocate advocate a whole food plant based diet, and vegetables aren't that expensive. No. And, Beans, beans are not expensive beans, at all. Beans are not expensive at all, yeah. and tofu is not expensive. Yeah. Um, and I, I shop at my local veg man, and he he always gives me a deal on like mushrooms and like fresh fruit and veg, and um, and it's it's not expensive. It's uh, it become it becomes expensive if you're looking for all these alternatives like the cheeses or the the top end coconut milk or yogurt. Um, yeah, well, those like those those, um, those no meat burgers and stuff like all of that sort of like when it's replacing an already uh, a meat based meal, yeah, then it's gonna be more expensive. But you're saying that if you just change what you eat completely, like change your lifestyle a little bit, bit more, um, or just change your food choices in general, then it's gonna be either cheaper or the same. Would you yeah, say? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I'd say cheaper. Nice. Um, the yeah it's like if you're buying ready meals it's a more expensive way to live right if you're yeah. if you're cooking your own food it's healthier and it's cheaper right? if yeah. you're eating whole foods which is what we advocate normally anyway right yeah so we want to like real food comes from the ground or and, we're, and we cook it we make it ourselves we know exactly what's in there um, we add spices and, and flavors and and it tastes delicious what would you what would you say to people that would argue that that's a bit of a big inconvenience it's difficult for me because I love cooking. I've also got a, a small catering business and, and it's a big passion of mine. Yeah. Um, but I, and it's also as a product of the world that we live in, that some people are so coarse, like um, this isn't um, necessarily a criticism. It's just an observation that so many people are caught up doing so much stuff. And we, we have such busy, busy lives now that we barely have time to cook our own food. Yeah, which you, I mean, if you if you think back a few hundred years ago, or or a thousand years ago, or if you look at in the animal kingdom or tribes or whatever, eating is most other living organisms' main thing that they have to do in the whole day. You know what I yeah, mean? Right. Like your whole day is about going out and getting food or or whatever it is, you know, or cooking it and preparing it, and then that's it, and then sitting down and eating it. Whereas now, yeah, like we don't even have time. We barely have time to eat let alone cook. Yeah, and, so, I, and I think that's crazy. Yeah. I, I honestly, I think that's crazy. I think we could, like, in an idealistic world, if we could just take a step back, breathe, enjoy life a bit more, <laughs> yeah. and take some time to cook, like, the time with the people that we love and the food that we love, and, it's like, everyone would be better off for it. Yeah, mate, that's awesome. It's so true. Um I also think, I guess, if you are that busy, and like, like you can't cook three or four meals a day, like, obviously, ob- the classic prep ahead of time is, is always a go-to. And then you can use fasting as well to your benefit if, if you think that's a good idea. Like, you know, then, you, then you've got less meals to have to cook and eat, and then you can make bigger meals and feel more satisfied if you do it that way. I Absolutely, think. right. And that's, and that's pretty much, I, I advise the same thing. That's how I live. Like I'll often, so if you have a, on my Instagram, I'll often put out like maximum 30 minute meals or like 20 minute meals. So some things that are really simple to chuck, chuck in together. The biggest change with a plant-based diet is just that you have to think differently, but really like stir fry, stir fries are the easiest things to cook. Um, stir fries or, or like just bung things in the oven and roast them. Like yeah. baked toast is really good. Baked, like roasted vegetables, fantastic. Um, and I personally generally live like my, the first meal, I'll fast until 12 o'clock. First meal will be like either overnight oats that I've just chucked in the, like a batch of them at the beginning of the week. And I've got a, a fridge of like five pots of overnight oats. The 
Um, so they're easy to grab, or I'll have a smoothie bowl. Um, lunch will be leftovers from dinner before, and dinner will take maximum 30 minutes, most usually like a stir fry or or something along those lines, or like a lentil or like a dal and nice like a sort of bowl and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And then actually to expand on that whole cooking and whatnot thing, I, I actually have found recently that um, just so I, I, I've been prepping my, you know, my meals during the day ahead of time, but now I've started cooking, like making a distinct effort to cook and eat dinner, um, you know, in the evening and sit down, no distractions. And it, you enjoy it so much more, i found. Like you just enjoy your food. And so if you're enjoying your food, it's a lot easier to stay on. Like how much easier is it to stay on a diet when you, when, you, when you have that experience? Like you want to keep going towards that experience as opposed to, you know, if you're eating a ready meal that you're on the go or, or you're eating a bar out of your car, like, that's not fun. That's not, that's an inconvenience and that's stressful and you want to get away from it. So, yeah, oh, I think mate, there's a lot of there's merit. So, there's so many benefits. Yeah. Just, you just create such a better relationship with food. Yeah. When, you're, when you're handing that food, you're putting it together, you're investing a bit of effort into making that meal taste good. Um, you, you know exactly what's going in there. Oh, I, I think you're right. I I think there's, I mean, I'm, you're preaching to the choir here because I love cooking. Yeah. All right. So um, I, I guess before before we wrap this up completely, I would like to find out, like, so as you were transitioning from, uh, like, so as you said, what, what was your first, what are the stages again that you, you broke it down into uh, when you decided that you wanted to be more conscious? So I did about six months where I was just eating chicken and fish a few times a week. Then quite quickly, I was vegetarian. I was pretty much vegetarian for a week and then plant based. Okay. And then, yeah. So, what was the what was the biggest or what was the hardest hurdle out of those three? I guess. Well, as soon as I decided to go plant based, I happened to be in Malaysia, and there weren't many options because they even cooked all the vegetables in butter. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was so. And because with my work um, with MotoGP, we travel all over the world, mm -hmm. um, generally about 24 to 25 weeks of the year. Um, and those, like when you're away, it's difficult to, especially when you're in hospitality and so, and they're catering for you and uh, you know, there's maybe like one or two vegans in like the whole team. Yeah. Um, they, it's, it's difficult in those situations and it's also difficult to know where to go. There's a fantastic app called Happy Cow, which is basically like TripAdvisor for vegetarian and vegan restaurants. Nice. Which has been a lifesaver for me. It's yeah. amazing. It's well worth the money. It's like two quid. And um, and then just being able to make meals and being prepared. So being prepared. So I'll take um, just extra bars just to make sure I know that I've got everything I need when I go away. So I'll take maybe like – a combination of hemp seeds and certain nuts to like top up my cereal or my breakfast or fruit in the morning um, and I'll take like a few like protein bars like cliff bars or something that uh, that will just keep me going through the day nice um, and I think that's what's so cool about that is that it's yeah it's not too dissimilar to anyone that's trying to diet right it's just knowing what you've got ahead of time being prepared making sure that you've you know you don't let yourself have to become reactive and choose shitty options because you've been proactive about it and yeah, you're ahead of time. Yeah. That's it. It's just about being prepared. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was, so it's interesting that you, that you say that because it must, that must've been the hardest. Cause what, what I found is the less I've tried to like, so basically I've cut out any sort of chicken out of my diet. Um, well, especially any, well, so I've, I've bought, I've not, I'm making an effort. I'm not buying any factory farm chicken or anything. I, I, I occasionally have it at a restaurant now, but that sort of thing. But then once you start to go vegetarian and whatnot, like fish or pescatarian fish and uh, dairy become like crutches. Like they're like my main staple. And so now to have to then get rid of dairy seems kind of overwhelming. But I mean, I guess once you just buy into it, then you're always going to find ways, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think... So I spoke, speak with a lot of people about this and, and they ask me questions and people who go vegetarian, I, biggest advice is you have to be careful with the, because obviously you eat a vegan meal and it's vegetarian anyway, right? So people see vegetarianism as a stepping stone, but generally they rely on a lot of cheese and cheese comes with a lot of saturated fat. Yeah. And that's something that you have to be careful of. 
Um, and yeah, sorry, I've forgotten what the other point I was going to make. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, mate. Um, yeah, it's it is like the the two uh, just. I think the more you go towards being plant based the more you rely on those last few things that aren't quite plant-based and you're like, Ugh. but I think, yeah, it's, it's for sure. Once you've decided that that's what you want to do. Um, I don't see like, you know, there's no hard science to say that the, the, uh, it's necessarily going to be, give you like these amazing health benefits, but you're experiencing it firsthand and you were rel- you were very healthy beforehand. So it's really interesting to hear like these accounts and you know how this happens like firsthand. But you know, I think you really do have to buy into it. You seem a lot less stressed. You seem like you enjoy like you really enjoy the fact that you are plant based. Whereas if someone didn't really want to do it, they're only doing it for their health benefits because they think it might lose them weight. I think that might end up being a little bit more stressful you know not as easy but there's lots of lessons to take away from what they've heard so far today mate yeah don't get me wrong i don't suggest that a vegan diet is a healthy diet because you can still eat a shit vegan diet yeah right? um and i hate that there's a documentary called what the health yeah and so many people like that i see online and say to me oh yeah i watched what the health and then i went vegan and and, and it's amazing and i'm like well you need to rethink your choices because that's a bullshit documentary. And I will happily say that openly. Like, I, there's, there's some good information out there on the internet and there's a lot of bullshit. But in a nutshell, what the health bastardizes um, statistics around obesity and then implies that meat, all these meat eaters are also obese. So eating meat, and then they take a huge leap of faith and say, well, eating meat causes all of these, causes all these diseases. Right. And to be and, honest, and that's that's not true. That's not true. You can't just infer that from the statistics because obesity is highly correlated with all these diseases, and eating meat in a standard American diet is highly correlated with obesity. Just because it's normal to eat meat, and most people are, seem to be obese these days. Yeah, and I mean, and that's that's such a like a subtle nuance, and that's why I, f- I thought it was so good to get you on here to talk about this because it's like you know you're plant-based you're a vegan but you're 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 objectively vegan you're not just trying to get everyone to convert to your way of thinking it's not a religion it's just what you choose to do and you can still look at it objectively and say hang on this doesn't necessarily mean this or this doesn't mean this and you know when it's very easy especially on the internet to make really simplistic arguments rather than look at things in detail that's that's and that is the biggest benefit i think to having this podcast for sure yeah, absolutely. I still like. I still come from like a scientific background. Really, that's my approach to to training and and S and C. And and you have to be critical of these things. You have to analyze research. You have to say, okay, I might say that, but it's a bullshit study. Or like, they, okay, yeah. they they may have found they may have found this, but they used they found this with five people. Does is that really <laughs> significant to like the whole world? Maybe yeah. not. Yeah, exactly. And. Um... That's awesome. I think it's my, my like my favorite answer and my most common answer is always it depends because that's the the subtleties of the world that we live in. Everyone is different with diet, with training, with all of that sort of stuff. Uh, yeah. yeah. So where can everyone go and find more information about you? Um, what would you? Uh, where would you like to send the guys that are listening that would like to find out more, either about becoming a vegan or be, be, about becoming like a world class skier? <laughs> um, well, they can certainly get in touch via Instagram. I seem to spend a lot of my time um, posting content on Instagram at the moment. Don't so, we? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm just, I'm actually rebranding my performance coaching services. So my current Instagram handle is at Matt Dickens SC, but I'm rebranding everything as Atlas Health Performance. So the website is atlashealthperformance.co.uk. And I will probably change my Instagram handle to Atlas Health Performance as well. Nice. Well, I'll make sure that uh, when this episode goes out, that will be up to date. So you'll be fine on that. So go ahead and go give him a follow, guys. Um, he's going to be back on for the next episode where we do our quickfire Q&A. But for now, guys, take care and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you. All right, guys, thank you very much for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode or if you've enjoyed any episode of the Robbie Muscle Podcast, please go ahead and give us a five-star rating and type a quick review. It takes about a minute 
and it really helps us out a ton, helps grow the show, helps grow Rugby Muscle, and in turn, we will be able to give you guys the best quality content, information, and programs that we possibly can. If you're interested in any of that stuff, like the free physique nutrition video series, or the TJ Strength Supplement Guide, or the 50 free rugby conditioning sessions, you can find them all at rugby-muscle.com, or by going through my Instagram profile, at tj.strength. Give me a quick follow, and until next time, guys, I've been your host, as always, TJ. See you soon.